Today we're going to discuss how our eyes perceive light and therefore perceive images. Seeing is believing is one of the tritest phrases in the English language and it turns out that the way our eyes perceive information is quite fascinating and a bit complicated. So it's not just enough to say seeing is believing, especially when it comes to something like an image that might be generated by an X-ray satellite. Our story begins over 2100 years ago when Hipparchus roamed the earth. Now it probably is just a continuation of a saga that began even earlier but because we have no records of anything, and that unfortunately is due to the burning of the Alexandria Library, our first record really is an indirect one from Ptolemy, who told about how Hipparchus developed a system to understand the brightnesses of stars. What, is, what Hipparchus did is he assigned six levels of what he called magnitudes to the just noticeable differences between brightnesses of stars in the night sky. And much to the consternation of countless generations of astronomy students since, he assigned the smaller number, like the first magnitude, to the brighter stars. And the faintest magnitude, sixth magnitude, were for stars that were much dimmer. So we have to understand that the magnitude scale varies inversely with the brightness of your object. The brighter the object, the smaller the magnitude. Not a real problem, not a showstopper, but just something to consider for the future. And interestingly enough, even though it was 2100 or 2200 years ago, this magnitude system of just noticeable differences has been propagated throughout and is still used by astronomers today with certain refinements that we will discuss. Basically, the refinement that we have done is we have assigned, more or less arbitrarily, based on Hipparchus's result, that any change of five magnitudes in an object's brightness corresponds to a factor of 100 in actual brightness. Okay? Delta M equaling five corresponds to a factor of a hundred in brightness and we'll discuss this matter shortly. But before we do that we have to fast forward to around 1850 which coincidentally or maybe not so coincidentally corresponds also with the advent of photography. In the 1850s a German physicist Gustav Fechner found out that he could assign a just noticeable difference to a particular stimulus only if that change in the amount that was necessary to produce that just noticeable difference was proportional to the stimulus itself. Now let's think about that for a second. What that basically means is that if you are confronted with two lines drawn on a piece of paper, one line is very, very small and the other one is just a little bit bigger, when that line is small, you can actually detect a very, very small change in that size of the line. However, if you have a very, very large line drawn on your paper, you'll be very hard put to be able to distinguish that line from one that's just a minor difference bigger. In other words, the amount of change in the length of the line or the amount of change in the amount of brightness of a star that you can detect 
as a just noticeable difference is proportional to the length of the line or the actual magnitude of the star itself. Now the consequences of this are fairly astonishing. One of the things that this implies, believe it or not, is the fact that the stars come out at night. How can that almost silly statement of fact mean something as far as our understanding about the way the eye functions and behaves. And in order for us to do that, we have to look at the circumstances surrounding looking at a star, both in the daytime and the nighttime. And in order to do this, we are going to assign a new unit of brightness. And I'm going to call this unit of brightness an ELISA in honor of my granddaughter's first birthday that just occurred. So here's the situation. During the daytime, we have a star and we have a sky. The starlight has to travel through the sky to get to us. And so when we're looking at the star, we are looking at the superposition of the star's light and the sky's light. The same thing is true during the nighttime. We have a star, which we'll think is of as the same star, and a sky that is significantly darker than it is during the day. So let's assign a brightness or a set of brightnesses to these objects. Let's suppose that at nighttime we're looking at a star whose light has a brightness of 10 ELISAs and the sky has a brightness of 1 ELISA. During the daytime the situation is similar in the sense of the star still has a brightness of 10 ELISAs, but now our skylight, we will say arbitrarily, has a brightness of 10,000 ELISAs. So it's 10,000 times brighter in the sky during the daytime than it is at night. And now we just develop a very simple table consisting of daytime and nighttime. And we're going to imagine that we look at the star and the sky. So this is when we're looking on the star or at the star, and this is off the star. Just at the sky. So what happens? During the daytime, when we're looking at the star, we are seeing the brightness of the star itself plus the brightness of the sky by itself for a total of 10,010 ELISAs. When we're looking off the star, we are going to see a brightness of 10,000 ELISAs, just the skylight. During the nighttime, when we look at the star, we see a total of 10 ELISAs worth of starlight plus one ELISA worth of skylight for a total of 11 ELISAs. When we just look at the sky itself, we could actually draw little arrows here to show what we're looking at, and the same thing would be true for the daytime as well. Situation is 
somewhat like this. When we look off the star at night, we are just seeing the skylight, and that amounts to one ELISA. Now, here's the kicker. Look at the differences in brightness between the two situations. You would think that if the stars came out at night, there would be a difference between what you see during the daytime and what you would see at nighttime. But look at this. During the daytime on the star, we have 10,010 ELISAs. Off the star, we have a, diff we have a total of 10,000 ELISAs for a difference of 10 ELISAs. Look at what happens at night. At night, on the star, we see a total of 11 ELISAs of brightness. Off the star, we see one ELISA for a difference of 10 ELISAs. They are the same. What that means is that if our eyes actually responded to differences of brightnesses, we would be able to see the stars during the day. We don't. And what that means is our eyes don't respond to differences of brightnesses. They respond to multiples of brightnesses. Let's see how that works. Imagine you have two stars, and the first star has a magnitude of 1, and the second star has a magnitude of 6. It turns out that a difference of magnitudes equaling 5 corresponds to a factor of brightnesses, the brightness of star 1 over the brightness of star 2, equal to 100. The first magnitude star is 100 times brighter than the faintest star that the eye can see. And for each five magnitudes difference, it's another factor of a hundred. So for instance, if we were co to compare a first magnitude star to an eleventh magnitude star, a delta M equaling ten corresponds to a brightness factor of 10,000. What this means and the consequence of this is pretty astonishing. It means that our eye has a tremendous dynamical range. We can perceive with our eyes about more or less 25 magnitudes of differences in the sky. That corresponds to an astonishing 10 billion times from the faintest object that we can perceive to the brightest object that we can perceive. Comparing that to the best CCDs that we have for our digital cameras, which only have a dynamic range of maybe 10,000, we are able to actually look at objects in the sky about a million times more sensitively than we can with a ordinary camera or any other type of recording device. That means that our eyes can really perceive a tremendous range in brightness. And not only that, that seems to apply to stimuli that are auditory, things that you can hear, although it's not quite as good for your ear as it is for your eye. And this is what Fechner found out in the 1850s. And we can summarize that very easily. The change in a stimulus 
that is necessary to produce a just noticeable difference in perception is proportional to the stimulus itself. That means that the change of brightness that we can perceive as a just noticeable difference is proportional to the brightness and things like that. Change in a sound intensity proportional to the intensity itself. What that means is that our eyes are logarithmic detectors. This is why you should study why logarithms exist. This is the description of the way we perceive radiation. And now we need to look at x-ray images and again see how these considerations apply to objects that we really can't see. We do not have any sensitivity to x-ray light at all. So when we get an image in our telescope, we have to create some sort of color map. And right off the get-go, this is going to be a false color map because there aren't any colors that correspond to X radiation that our eyes can perceive. We have to make the invisible visible. And how we do it is somewhat arbitrary, very interesting, and afterwards we'll come back and say, is seeing believing? And if it is, then what actually are we seeing in terms of an X-ray image? And so from here, we have to go to our trusty piece of software, DS9, and look at an image of an X-ray source. And that's what we're going to do next.